Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Zoe Daniel and I'm your moderator for this event, the first in this webinar series looking at climate change and erosion and associated impacts along the Great Ocean Road. I'm a former ABC journalist and foreign correspondent with a personal interest in this subject, having owned a house with my husband at Separation Creek near Wye River for about 10 years. For millennia, this area has been a rich spiritual, cultural and material resource and home for its Indigenous owners, the people of the Watarong and Eastern Ma clans. We acknowledge the traditional owners of this country, pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and warmly welcome them and any other First Nations people who are attending this webinar. This series of webinars organised by the Great Ocean Road Communities Network will look at the current and emerging impacts of climate change, particularly on coastal erosion, how we're responding to these pressures now and how to plan for the future. Today, we open the series with accounts of real live encounters with the changing face of our coast as experienced at three sites along the Great Ocean Road. Anglesey, Wye River and Apollo Bay have been chosen because each place, while unique, also provides us with stories that embrace larger issues and concerns about how the pressures and impacts of coastal erosion already evident have been handled so far and what our communities now expect or puzzle over. Each place has contrasting yet comparable tales about the experiences of community and public agency responses and different capacities for handling future events. Our panel today, Jeff Westcott, a retired academic from Deakin University, who's an expert with deep lived experience in our region, Juliet Lefevre, representing the Wye River Separation Creek Community Association, and Peter Fillmore from Apollo Bay and Secretary of Otway Forum. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. Jeff, Juliet and Pete will provide some more details about themselves when they start and they'll each talk for around 15 minutes. We'll hold any questions and discussion until we've heard from them all. And then we will turn to your questions. If you do have a question, please go to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and type it in. And so now, Jeff, we'll begin with your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, um, uh, and thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, first, I'd like to also pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on um, and the traditional owners of the land and sea country. Uh, my attachment to Anglesey goes back uh, at least 50 years. So my parents bought a holiday house on the hill at Anglesey uh, back in 1972 and uh, the family's been coming down ever since that time. And I suppose the other uh, early attachment was, I worked on the coastal study of the Public Interest Research Group, which produced a book, which some people may have seen in 1977, called A Coastal Retreat, which looked at coastal management at both uh, what is now the Bass Shire and the Surf Coast Shire. I then uh, proceeded to do a PhD on Victorian coastal policy and uh, lobbied the various parties along the way to try to get a coastal legislation to cover the whole coast. And I was fortunate enough to chair the coastal reference group, uh, which uh, made the recommendations leading to the Coastal Management Act in 1995. And then uh, following on from that, almost 20 years later, uh, chairing the expert panel that uh, made the recommendations leading to the uh, leading to our current legislation, the Marine and Coastal Act of 2018. So it's been a long and very enjoyable uh, journey for me. Um, and of course, uh, it has been always delightful uh, to come down that Great Ocean Road, take that last turn and see Point Road night and uh, the ocean open up for the first time as you come down into Anglesey. So what I was going to do today, as you can see on that first slide, I was going to have a, a look at, it may get to four cases, uh, it will be dependent on time, of course. Uh, and so uh, I will start with two well known and very current ones, and then move on to a couple more, but they're a bit more speculative and we'll see how the timing goes on those. First of all, I'd like to uh, point out, and I think most people will realize this, that the coastline along the Anglesey coastline is a eroding coastline by and large, um, and that has always uh, been the case. And you can see there in that first uh, slide, the Soapy Rocks area uh, of Point Road night, 
you were looking back from the point. And that is a pretty classic landslip for this kind of uh, coastline with a very soft sediment um, cliff face. And one of the features there is that the whole, you can see the whole face of the cliff actually just slipped down the slope rather than sort of collapse outwards. Uh, it is undermined and then slips down and in many cases carries um, significant vegetation with it on that, uh, on that slide. Now, the reason I'm um, putting that picture there before I talk about Demon's Bluff is just to paint that background that coastal erosion and deposition are natural processes, climate change is accelerating them. And that's one of the major sort of take home messages. Uh, this picture is from the top of um, the Parker Street Hill, and it is looking uh, towards Point Addis, is in the distance there, and the main uh, bluff in the four, well, in the mid, mid of the picture is Demon's Bluff. Um, on this picture, I just want you to note two things that uh, locals would be very familiar with. Um, there is that very um, straight lined, rather silver coloured area crossing the coastal heathland. That is the new boardwalk of the clifftop walk, but over right on the edge of the coast, you can just see a little sandy track there which is uh, the past cliff face walk. And that leads me to talk about the impact of what is actually an accelerated natural process. So the, with, uh, sea, with a small rise in sea level, with um, accelerated storm surges, with high tides, Demon Bluff, that uh, big bluff in, the, in that picture is being eaten away slowly at the bottom and has now resulted, as most of you will be aware, in having to retreat the coastal path, that very yellow, slightly yellow one on the edge has had to be in, brought uh, inland at considerable cost. Uh, you can see there's where the tracks close and anybody who's walked this area knows that you now walk well back from the cliff in the interest of public safety. And here's the new walk across that coastal uh, heathland. And um, just to give you a perspective, the first photo of Beams Bluff was taken from the hill in the background, that straight up road. So there's been a retreat in classic style and classic coastal management style as a, as a cliff walk has got dangerous on the top, the uh, track has had to be moved inland. Um, and that's a, a very expensive process to say the least. Um, apart from anything else, but completely necessary for public safety. Meanwhile, down on the beach, you used to be able to walk all the way around, and particularly at low tide, two point out on that beach. And only a matter of weeks ago, and you, many of you may have seen the ABC News uh, broadcast on this. And you, if you go to the ABC News website um, and search Demon's Bluff, you'll get the full story. Uh, it has been permanently closed to walkers um, because it is of danger of that cliff not collapsing outwards, but sliding down uh, the side and uh, causing a sort of, a, if you like, an avalanche at the bottom. And if you were at the bottom, you could easily be buried in it. So public safety has resulted in the closure of Demon's Bluff. Now, implications, this is the point at which I want to mention something that uh, I think Victorians take for granted uh, and has possibly left to, led to some complacency, but is, got, is a tremendous bonus at a time of uh, climate change. And that's the 1879 Foreshore Reservation. Uh, this reservation uh, occurred the Victorian Parliament, reserved all remaining public land on the Victorian coast in 1879. Some of it's only one chain right wide, uh, your length of the cr cricket pitch wide, but in many places it uh, is, is much wider than that. Uh, we, we just sort of assume it. It's that foreshore reserve that you can see to the left-hand side of the Grand Ocean Road before it was added to the park. Um, and uh, probably both most commonly, you, if you're driving down Beach Road in Melbourne, um, you will see the coastal foreshore uh, between you and uh, the actual water. This is an incredible advantage because it has meant that with ordinary or normal coastal erosion and movement of deposition and erosion, you've, you've got a buffer zone. 
And that buffer zone, when you come down and look at Demon's Bluff, has allowed the clifftop walk to be moved, um, you know, 30, 40 metres inland. But what happens if the uh, foreshore reserve is very narrow and it is completely lost? We just have not actually got a philosophy yet or a policy yet to work out what we do if that occurs. So Demon's Bluff is a classic example of something that is happening and has had a, a positive management response, uh, but it does raise that issue um, in the bigger picture. I'll just move on now to, this is uh, the beach between Point Road Night is at the far end of that picture. And um, behind me in this photo would be Urquhart's Bluff. So this is uh, erosion on the ocean coast side of Point Road Night. You can see that the erosion has recently uh, gone through where uh, the fence, that fence, as many of you will know, has been buried for many, many years. Um, and you can see by the footprints there and where the uh, water has got up to that it is now eating into what is the uh, prime, what is known as a, as a major dune. So there's quite a bit of differential erosion along that long beach frontage and a risk to the main dune. Uh, in several places along, you can see in this case, the primary dune, I'm now looking the opposite direction, I'm looking west. The primary dune, the small dune that is often the first protector has already been eaten in half. And then the dune behind it is the main dune. And behind that is Melbourne Avenue and a whole series of pri private property. The, the challenge in this area is, um, we're, pro we're not monitoring exactly what is going on there. We're going to hear from two very good speakers next week who are experts in these areas. Uh, so we really need to have some serious monitoring start to happen. Um, the Great Ocean Road and Park Authority may well be the body to, to do so and help us out on this front. Uh, I also would mention education. The, um, for those of us who have been coming down for a long time or have been involved in environmental management for a long time, we do remember the, the Soil Conservation Authority, um, which went out of business in 1984 um, and was full of educational material about not abusing the dunes, about using your tracks. The thing that stuns me about this piece of coastline at the moment is that um, certainly from Melbourne, Ave Melbourne Avenue, there are tracks coming through, there are blowouts in the dunes, there are people skiing down the dunes. We really do need an educational campaign to remind people that that dune is the only thing standing between them, uh, the houses on the forefront there and, and the ocean. In this case, the retreat is not possible. So uh, what do you do beyond that? You're really going to have to work hard on that, on that um, in that area. Now, the other two I was going to mention, I'm just checking my time uh, carefully. So I will be more brief on these, and these are more speculative. Uh, this is certainly one of my favourite views. <laughs> I was going to say in Victoria, it's one of my favourite views in the world. The, the view of Point Road Night and the, and the bay and, sw and swimming beach at Road Night. I have it as my phone screensaver, in fact, without the road. Uh, now... I think the interesting thing there is, that, and this is more personal observation, it seems to me that the, there's been a lot of sand deposited in that bay and you just always used to have, a, you know, you'd go in the water, you'd have a one little uh, rise, um, then you'd have a deep water essentially, maybe a second uh, sort of a sandy bottom rise. But now it looks to me like it's quite possible that sand is coming around the corner from Point Road night on that Urquhart's Buff Beach and filling that area in. Again, I think the response here is we need a good geomorphologist to have a long-term study of this. Um, the implications, uh, I might be wrong, but um, it, if it's really occurring is, a, is that that embayment may fill rapidly in. Uh, this is Point Road Night Beach is one of the few family safe swimming beaches um, along the surf coast and it's easy in a way to because you look out of your window or as you walk along the beach to think of um, how many beaches there are but there are not that many that are this close to Melbourne 
on, on, a, on a surf beach, on an ocean area that are very safe. So the future of that um, beach um, is, is significant in the bay itself. Um, even more speculative and uh, the Anglesey River um, with some of uh, our wood ducks heading out or heading upstream, in fact. Uh, now I'm getting into real spec. There is certainly the river does look uh, unhealthy. Um, in this picture, you can see how much uh, that set, sort of crescent shaped area from the sedges past that post, that's the edge of the Anglesey River. Um, this was uh, a couple of weeks ago and with a high tide or with the blocked, with the mouth blocked, it floods very quickly and very easily. The colour of that water is also um, a little bit disturbing, but uh, this is certainly disturbing. It, the actual river looks in, to the naked eye, looks like it's not looking very healthy. The colour is curious. There has been one of the very few acid sulphate soil exposures in the state of Victoria, rare in Victoria, um, near Kugara Park, um, probably well, more than a decade ago. Um, we know the Anglesey River was diverted um, for the Alcoa uh, coal mine. Um, and now the pit is being filled by a variety of means. And I know Barwon Water is having a look at um, groundwater to help fill that pit, but some of the water certainly from the Anglesey River is, is, is also being used. The, we really need to have a full-blown estuarine study. Again, it has been done. Um, the current sort of condition is there, but you know, what is the long-term health of the river? What are the aesthetics? And um, what in fact uh, is the floor, impact on flora and fauna of that river? So um, Zoe, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, I hope that was a good snapshot of um, some of the inter interesting issues facing Anglesey. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Jeff. Very good to have your expertise here. And a reminder, put your questions into the Q&A screen, which you can access by hitting the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll get to questions at the end. A couple of comments in that screen. Deborah says, oh dear, no hooded plover nesting habitat left. And of course, habitat for our, our bird life and our native animals is one of the big issues that we're facing as part of what's happening along our coast. And Regina makes the comment, at least two coastal organisations, Gorkapa and Ecologic Education, currently run free dune education programs. There's also federal funding for a dune area program. I guess a, a question of um, whether those programs are getting through to the community. Let's move on to Juliet, who will speak for 15 minutes. Juliet, over to you. All right, thanks, Zoe. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of Wai River, the Gadabanad people, and their care for country over countless generations. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I'm Juliet Lefevre, and I've been I'm visiting Wai River regularly for almost 30 years, and have owned a house there since 1998. I'm vice president of the Wai River and Separation Creek Community Association and a founding member of the local Estuary Watch and Water Watch citizen science groups. My working life has been all about the protection and restoration of Victoria's stress rivers and advocating for them to enjoy a fair share of their own water. I'm going to start sharing my screen, so hopefully this works well. Oh, bingo. Whoops. Yes, let's skip to slide number two. Uh, Wai River is a small town of incredible beauty and most of its residents, holiday homeowners and long-term campers are there because they love the place. I think Zoe will attest to that and it holds great meaning for them. The Surf Life Saving Club is the, at the heart of our community, not only because of its activities on the beach and in the surf, but because the clubhouse is used for all kinds of activities, weddings, parties, anything. It's also a bushfire refuge and a meeting place for volunteers in case of emergency. In 2015, it served as the nerve center for the firefighting operations during the bushfire emergency and was the scene of many community meetings in the recovery period. The building made us feel safe. We never imagined that a few years later it would be under threat from erosion. 
why has many community groups, of which our Estuary Watch group is one? We got started in 2014, and every fortnight we take the same photos from the Y River Bridge at 10 a.m. on Sundays to give a long-term record of what's happening to the estuary. This is how the beach looked in 2015. Here, here we're looking to the east and the foreshore campground, and here to the south and towards Point Sturt. It's a pretty typical scene with the lagoon and the river meandering towards the southern end of the beach, how most of us remember it over generations of the summer holidays. The river ambled about a bit from year to year, at one time threatening the picnic benches and their retaining wall, but it never seemed likely to cause serious damage. All that has changed over the last few years. We began to notice sand loss from the eastern end of the beach, and slowly but surely the river began to migrate its course across the beach. By early 2020, the view from the bridge looked like this, with the river hugging the campground and the fishing platform, quite different from what we were used to. Down on the beach, we were seeing significant sand loss in the tidal zone and erosion of the dunes in front of the campground and surf club. It's hard to know which was chicken and which was egg, river migration or sand loss, but the combination was quite devastating. We're beginning to lose vegetation from the dunes and the beach access path from the campground now had a two meter drop off and had to be blocked off. The gradual erosion continued over many months and it was becoming increasingly obvious we had a serious problem. There wasn't much reaction from the land manager, the Otway Coast Committee. A study was commissioned and a bit of sand shoveled back up to the dunes for the start of the 2021 summer season. Then in January this year, we had a flood. With over 200 meters of rain in the catchment, our river became a raging torrent. It was quite spectacular. And masses of sand and mud and debris were washed out to sea. The flood caused a big change to the river upstream of the bridge, with all the sand that had accumulated over a period of years washed away. But once it had subsided, not much changed on the beach itself, and nobody felt the need to take any action. We enjoyed our summer, while the insidious process of erosion continued, and little by little, the dunes were washed away. Then, after Easter this year, things got serious. Here's a shot of the surf club clubhouse in happier times. You can see it's got a disabled access ramp outlined in red to allow wheelchair access to the building and also a beach access ramp down here for the surf club uh, vehicles to equipment to get down for their patrols. It was well protected by this lovely vegetation on the dunes, which was actually planted by the community more than 50 or 60 years ago. By mid-May this year, these dunes have been eroded to such an extent that the disabled access ramp here was beginning to collapse. It was beginning to be undercut. None of us had imagined that ever such a thing was ever, could ever happen. And the beach access ramp was also on the point of collapse. You were really getting into some serious property damage. By now, alarm bells were ringing loudly in the community. The surf club was in urgent communication with Gore Kappa, which had taken over as land manager, requesting emergency action to protect the dunes, ramps and clubhouse. They got a breezy response saying, yes, we know you've got a problem. Don't worry, we'll do a bit of sand scraping to protect you. A bobcat arrived and moved some sand around, but the erosion didn't stop. By now we were getting desperate and our community leaders from the Surf Club Community Association and CFA joined forces to demand action. We lobbied Gore Kappa, DELP and Karangamite CMA, but it wasn't until we got in touch with the Environment Minister's office that they began to take any notice of us. Meanwhile, the erosion continued. And by the end of the June, the disabled ramp was sliding inexorably down the dunes. We upped our efforts. A rock drop was promised and then withdrawn. A sandbag shortage discovered. How could this be? Gore Kappa, the authority charged with managing coastal erosion, did not have a stock of sandbags on hand. 
At one point, we've considered going to Bunnings and getting our own. More sand scraping occurred, but with little impact. The agency seemed incapable of grasping the urgency of the situation and community frustration was going through the roof. We, we cajoled, we implored, we raged, but the erosion continued. On 19th of July, the disabled ramp collapsed completely onto the beach. More than 10 meters of dune had been lost and the surf clubhouse itself seemed to be in imminent danger. At this point, after more than two months of impassioned pleas from the community, the agencies finally came up with a plan. It's actually a pretty simple plan. Move sand from this purple area over here. You see, here's the river, there's the uh, uh, access ramp, and there's a disabled ramp, which was more collapsed than in the photo. So you move sand from the purple area across the river to the other side, stockpile it here, and then lay a line of sandbags at the foot of the dune through this area here. It's not exactly rocket science and just what we've been suggesting all the way along. There followed another couple of weeks of intense frustration all round while contractors were engaged, permission sought and sandbags found. Ollie, the project manager from Gorkapa, nearly went mad. Finally, work started in late July with some seriously heavy machinery in action. It didn't take long to get the line of sandbags in front of the surf club, not a moment too late. The consultants actually revised their plans and improved them to build some groins to allow more sand to accumulate in this area in front of the, of the surf club. They were going to put in three groins, A, B and C, built out of sandbags. This happened really quickly. Once they got going, they, they, they did a fantastic job building it in the space of a couple of weeks. You can see the sandbags here, which are going into the groins. And the work was completed on the 11th of August. It was immediately effective. The river moved right away from the dunes, deflected by the groins. It's quite an amazing result and such a relief for all of us. It's a relatively simple, soft intervention. It's been remarkably effective in halting the erosion of the dunes and changing the course of the river. So far, no further work has been required, even after another flood in September, though we'd love to see a plan for the groin upkeep as they inevitably sink into the sand. Unfortunately, the beach itself is still being washed away. But our surf club is protected for now. And the river diverted. But did we need to wait for months for the authorities to take action? Did we need to lose so much? Was the property damage avoidable? Just have a look at this photo of where we are now and compare it with where we came from. Oops, wrong way. All this enormous area of dunes down here has been lost, cut back to right here. And there's been $150,000 worth of damage to this ramp. And this one has been lost altogether. There's no certainty that the surf club will get an insurance payout to cover the cost of removing the ramp. And there's no promise of financial assistance from the agencies either. The club is having to sort out alternative beach access for this coming summer season. And a big upgrade for the clubhouse to get new disabled access. Could all this have been avoided if the sandbags and grinds have gone in three months earlier? We seek answers from the authorities as to why it took so long and why they seem so ill-prepared for what was a foreseeable disaster. But this is only the beginning of our problems. Why River has already experienced the early impacts of climate change with the bushfires on Christmas day, 2015, that destroyed 116 homes, closely followed by floods and landslides in 2016 that closed the ocean road for days. Now, not only has our main beach been seriously eroded, the beach at Separation Creek has lost so much sand, it's now inaccessible at high tide. We feel like the proverbial canary in the coal mine. The experts seem to feel that what has happened at our beach is within the bounds of normal coastal erosion or the product of a small change in wind direction or wave height. The impacts of sea level rise are yet to be experienced. I'd always imagined the sea gradually lapping into the campground centimetre by centimetre 
and the surf club slowly becoming an island as levels rise. But that's not how it's going to happen. It will be far more dramatic than that. What we've just seen is a gradual process of erosion over years, suddenly reaching a tipping point with meters of dune and well-established vegetation lost in a few weeks. It's going to happen again, and the sandbags will be no match for the next onslaught. As climate change tightens its grip, there'll be more big events, storms, tides, floods, bushfires, and our forward planning needs to be robust but flexible enough to cope. We have a difficult road ahead deciding what to do. We're currently waiting for a consultant's report on longer term options to be defend our dunes in our surf club, originally promised in August, but now more likely in November. Further work will have to wait until after the coming summer season, more than a year after we first started raising the alarm with the authorities. We're looking to Gorkapa, Delp and Kolak Shire for leadership to help us through the process and for funds for the necessary works and repairs to our damage and infrastructure, but also to listen to us, the community, and make use of our knowledge built over generations. Ultimately, hard decisions will have to be made about the fate of the foreshore campground and the surf clubhouse. The question is, how, when, by whom, and who pays? We need to be clear about who is responsible for the division between public and private and the role of insurance in paying for climate-induced in disasters. The other question is, when are our governments going to stand up and get serious about reducing carbon emissions as from now? Sea level rise due to climate change is a certainty, but the amount is not. If we can grasp the remaining slim chance of limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees in line with the Paris agreements, we may be able to get away with an almost manageable half a meter by the end of this century. If not, then we're heading for disaster and a rise of up to seven or eight meters. If that happens, we'll be saying goodbye to a lot more than our surf club. Thanks. Thank you, Juliet, for that quite pithy dis description of the events at Y River in 2021. And, and just a disclaimer to say that I have been one of those directly involved in those somewhat fraught negotiations with the various authorities on behalf of the Y River Surf Life Saving Club. And those discussions remain ongoing. Your questions can go into the Q&A panel and we do have quite a few questions coming in, which is great to see. Before we go to questions though, let's hear from Pete. And after that, I'll put your questions to the panel. Pete, go ahead, please. You've stolen at least one of my lines there, Mary, um, but we'll get to that. Uh, hi, everybody. It's great that you have taken an interest uh, in this very special area. My name is Pete Fillmore, and I moved to Apollo Bay in 1977, age 21. I've spent the last 50 years surfing and fishing along this beautiful southern Otway coastline. I also established a native plant nursery during this time, and I also have a deep interest in the indigenous and early European history of this area. Surfers all around the world are the canaries in the coal mine for climate change impacts along our coastlines. Perhaps an unfortunate metaphor that uh, you got in just before me. Um, I first became, you can, um, whoever's doing the tech stuff behind the scenes, they can slip in the photos as I go along. Yeah, I've got about, um, six uh, little points and six photos to sort of go with it. I first became interested in climate change when the first Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report was released in 1990. Since then, I have witnessed an increase in storm surges and erosion all along this coast. About 10 years ago, the CSIRO climate scientists released a report explaining the changes we were seeing all along this coastline. Working in the fishing industry in Apollo Bay, I was aware that a lot, of a lot of eroded sand from the Apollo Bay back beach was becoming trapped in our harbour. This was then robbing the Apollo Bay front beach to the north of natural sand replenishment and threatening the, vi the viability of the Great Ocean Road. And that photo there is um, the annual erosion we sent to get at the end of Tuxton Road as you, just before you get to Apollo Bay. Um, so the sand that was getting trapped in the harbour was also um, yeah, robbing 
the front beach. So, and then thus threatening the viability of the Great Ocean Road. Uh, luckily enough down here, we've been studying this for the last 30 years. We've had over 20 detailed reports on all aspects of Apollo Bay's beaches and harbour. Um, we've had 20 detailed reports over 30 year period, plus numerous workshops, public information days and public meetings. Various cheap short-term measures such as sandbagging and artificial sand renourishment have failed to address these issues over the last 20 years. Finally, DWELP has convinced the state government ministers involved that a longer term solution is needed to be put in place to protect one of Australia's biggest tourist attractions, the Great Ocean Road. Um, you can move along to the next photo. Um, that's just one of the inundation storms. This is a sort of storm surge we're talking about. This is um, looking towards Wild Dog Creek. And this is actually the, the estuary of Wild Dog Creek as uh, goes all, all through here. And the Great Ocean Road is just to the side there on the right. Can't quite see it. And uh, funnily enough, there's plans to build a walking track through this bit, which well, I'll get to that later. Um, this is a sort of, sort of storm surges we're seeing three to four times a year now, whereas in the past, you might've only got one every five years or so. I mean, it's always varied. We know the climate's very variable, but with the acceleration of climate change, it's just becoming more and more common as, as was predicted by the uh, CSIRO. Um, you probably go to the next, uh, picture of the groins, oh, oh that's, that's a result of these sort of storm surges. Uh, the, great, um, the ocean is coming right across the Great Ocean Road and dumping sand on the road. This year it's happened three times uh, and in one, on one particular storm, it came across the road at a place that I've never ever seen it come across the road before. Um, so it's definitely accelerating and it can't be ignored. Um, you can go to the groin shot next. Oh, well, that's the, oh, sorry. Cut back to the, the one four. This is what we have sort of been um, doing over the last five to six years, you know, moving sand from one end of the beach to the other and just uh, hoping it's going to stay there. But um, this has been done five separate, on five separate occasions, costing about half a million dollars each time. Um, these trucks operate for about a month shifting sand from one end of the beach to the other. And within 12 months, it's all washed away again. So that's obviously not working. So um, we'll flick to the groin one now. Finally, DWELP has convinced the state government ministers involved that a longer term solution is needed to be put in place to protect one of Australia's biggest tourist attractions. Free 70 metre groin, rock groins and associated revetment walls are being built at the Apollo Bay front beach. This was first suggested in a 1996 study. You can see the harbour in the distance there. Four more rock groins are in the planning stage for the back beach at Apollo Bay. The Great Ocean Road here at the back beach is built on top of the primary dune and is also fast eroding away. The town of Apollo Bay is the closest town on the Great Ocean Road to the Australian continental shelf. Thus, the swells here are very big and powerful and constant. These storm surges also come with very high rainfall events, especially down here in the Southern Otways, which is very problematic with our very slip prone clay soils. And um, I'm sure you're, you've all come along the Great Ocean Road after a big storm and seen the rock falls and the landslips um, over the last, couple of years they've built uh, 30 sort of retaining walls below the Great Ocean Road just between Apollo Bay and Lawn to prop up the Great Ocean Road. Um, this is caused by the, the storm surges and the uh, climate events but also I believe by the very heavy traffic that's now common on the Great or well was common on the Great Ocean Road with the big tour buses up to 30 big tour buses and the same amount of smaller tour buses day in, day out, just uh, running along a road that's built on very clay soils that expand and contract quickly. 
uh, the road was never built for that sort of traffic. So that's another issue. The most recent reports commissioned by DWELP have also recommended that planning commences for rerouting sections of the Great Ocean Road where it is most vulnerable, such as our estuaries and sand dunes. This is yet to be agreed upon and funding accessed and planning begun. Um, you may remember the press door stopping the Minister Lily D'Ambrosio, is the Great Ocean Road going to be moved? No, she said. Well, the question should have been, have you read your own report where this is suggested or recommended? In fact, um, Colac Otway Shire and regional, regional Development Victoria continue to go ahead with planning to put more infrastructure such as walking and cycling tracks, car parks and toilets, et cetera, in the highly vulnerable coastal hazard zones. Example, the Wild Dog Creek to Skeens Creek coastal track. This is not needed or wanted and is completely unsustainable. It is, an ab it is absolute madness and a waste of $5 million of taxpayers' money. We should be trying to fix some of these problems, not creating more problems. The Auditor General, put out a report on these sort of issues two years ago and it's been completely ignored. The state government also keeps releasing policy and strategy documents using the 2008 IPCC sea level rise predictions of 80 centimetres by 2100. This should be immediately changed to at least the IPC's 2019 prediction of a minimum sea level rise of approximately 1.1 metres by 2000 and, um, 2100. Um, and that, that's a bare minimum prediction. It could be a hell of a lot worse than that. Through my interest in Aboriginal history of this area, I've witnessed multiple ancient shell middens, Aboriginal ancient shell middens, now collapse, collapsing onto our beaches and washing away with the more frequent and stronger storm surges and the accelerating sea level rise. These date from the first contact period 200 years ago and up to 1500 years before the present. Um, you can go across to the shot of the middens um, collapsing, if you like. Uh, Many of these middens are in very isolated areas and have not been damaged by direct human interaction. Um, to me, this is proof that the sea has not been up this high, the storm surges has not been up this high in at least 200 years. Um, it's very unfortunate that these pieces of our history are just disappearing, <laughs> not to mention the vegetation holding the sand dunes together. The Bureau of Meteorology um, has a sea level monitoring station at Bourne. This has been there about 20 to 30 years and has been averaging a 2.5 millimetre annual sea level rise for the last 10 years. So these sort of facts are irrefutable and the many, many reports we've had done on all aspects of the coastal regions, the swells, um, et cetera, have been well documented. And finally, we are getting some action. And like I say, this sort of action, long-term groins, it's a lot of money. It's millions and upon millions of dollars. And uh, people can be very critical of DWELP, but from my experience with them, they, they know what the problem is. It's convincing the politicians to take it seriously and actually act. And um, just to finish up, uh, in my opinion, the first solution to this accelerating climate emergency is for everyone to listen to what the climate scientists are telling us and stop burning fossil fuels as soon as possible. To achieve this, Australians must stop re-electing the conservative fossil fools in Canberra. Thank you for your, for your time. Thank you, Pete, for that presentation. If I could ask Pete, Juliet, and also Jeff to 
turn your cameras on and your microphones on, leave yourselves unmuted, and I'll pose some questions from the group. Um, I think one recurring theme from some of our questioners, which might be a good place to start, is around what our expectations are of our government and the authorities. Bruce says there's an assumption that someone will do something, say at Y River. Is this a requirement of any level of government other than as a moral requirement? And then Anthony follows up with a question around who pays coming off the back of Juliet's presentation saying, well, who pays for direct climate adaptation or resilience preparation for coastal private public assets, beaches, et cetera? It, it's a difficult question. If I could come to each of you just to try to navigate through some of those tricky issues, Juliet, given that it, it's sort of born from some of your comments, let's start with you. Yeah, it is. It's a really tricky question. I mean, you could build a concrete wall around the surf club and keep it there forever. I mean, that would be one option. But I mean, that's obviously not um, what, what we're headed for. I mean, what I think we as a community might like to see is our surf club protection in the short term while we sort out new and better options for what might be our, a longer term solution. You know, it seems to me the beach wants to, as Pete's slides show, the beach wants to move across the road and probably end up where our general store is right now. So, you know, do we want to, you know, do we want to look at you know, what things might be like in 20 years and then plan for that? And to also go to the comments about the Ocean Road, they're planning a new bridge at Y River. And the consideration is it should have one pillar or two, not should it be in such a position where it won't be underwater in 20 years time. So we've got a long way to go in, uh, in sorting those, those planning issues out. Hey, let's come back to you on government responsibility. Uh, to me, it's, there's an interesting evolution going on here. You mentioned 20 separate reports that have been done on the situation at Apollo Bay over the years. Now, why rivers grappling with this? And it's not only in the Great Ocean Road, obviously, inverlox has got all sorts of issues. So it's happening up and down. Are you getting a sense that there's a development of a system as a result of these experiences? Are our various government authorities learning from what works, what doesn't work, and then changing what they're implementing and the way that they interact with community? Uh, yeah, I think they're getting they're getting better for sure, and this is happening all around the world. And ultimately, like I said in that um, my last statement, there you, the big picture is you know, <laughs> we're entering a whole new era. You know what's come before is irrelevant, really. Um, I know, I know I've dealt with the departments, I've dealt with the politicians over the last twenty or thirty years. They all know me, and uh, I've got respect for the department officers. They're limited by budgets. And ultimately, it's the politicians who make the big decisions of, all right, we've got to stop burning fossil fuel fuels. All right, we've got to put money aside to adapt um, you know, in the short term. And, um, but it's a, it's a very big picture. And as we know, um, it's very hard for them to make a decision. But what do you think our expectations of them are? I mean, you know, you could sort of argue, well, you can't hold back the tide. No matter what we do, the, the ocean is going to do what it's doing. So, you know, from the perspective of the community at Apollo Bay, what do you think, you know, at its core, what do you think the community wants the authorities to do? Well, we're sick of these short-term solutions. They've been going on for, you know, 20 years. And um, Groins was suggested in 1996. I mean, like, how long do we have to wait? And it's accelerating. And all we expect is the politicians to... Um, believe the scientists, the climate scientists, not, not the journalists in the Herald Sun, you know, like we, we just want to, you know, the science has been there for 30 years. Um, you'll be speaking to one of the authors of that CSIRO report um, that I mentioned, you know, that came out at least 10, 12 years ago. And these are scientists. It's an in-depth report, but I can read it. I can understand it. I know, you know, it's hard for them. They're only looking at the election cycle every three years or whatever but uh, time has come. And Just getting back to your presentation, um, you know, you showed us some pretty interesting photos of what, what's happened at Anglesey over time that you've been monitoring it. Uh, and there's a question, 
Is the explanation more frequent storm surges, rising sea levels or, or, or both? And also, I, I sort of was pondering as you were giving your presentation, um, how, how do you tie climate to the kinds of erosion that you're seeing? And do we have any records from further back that show any sort of similar patterns or are we really in uncharted territory here? Well, we, we've got very good um, aerial photo data that goes back a very long way. And I mean, surprisingly enough, probably for people in Victoria, the Victorian coastline is one of the best studied coastlines in the world. Um, Eric Bird is probably, was um, one of the great global experts in this field. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to return a bit to the funding, if I can, Zoe, mm. because um, I was on the Coastal Council when uh, we drafted up the 2014 Victorian um, Coastal Strategy. And the question of where the money comes from, you know, where is the money raised uh, and where do you get the funds to, to run coastal management was one of the top five issues identified. And... I think in a way it's quite extraordinary that we actually, we, we have an estimate of how much tourism is valuable to the coast or communities and to the Victorian economy in general. But the, while the source of, um, if you like, wealth to the community is, is evident, you can't actually tap onto it. It disappears into general revenue consolidated revenue. And then as we've heard today, every local community begs to get some money to do X, Y, or, or Z. And so unless we can identify and um, probably be brave enough to source revenue and collect it together, for example, um, in the second um, big coastal, draft coastal strategy, a levy on the Great Ocean Road was suggested. You can imagine um, how that went down. But, a bed tax. We've seen uh, Sydney adopt a bed tax in the Olympic Games. Uh, there, there is money that can be generated, but it's the sort of uh, proposals that politicians really freak out at because the the lobby groups against where you would source money. You know, is it a dollar on a campsite and five dollars on a hotel room? Um, we've got electronic tags in all our cars. We're probably going to have to have them in our cars as we move to electric vehicles because that's how we go to sponsor road roadworks. Um, you've got busloads of people, or we had busloads of people coming down the coast in 55-seater buses. Not a penny of that at over $120, $130 for their day trip ended up with the coastal managers. So there is sources of income, but the business groups will crush them very, very quickly. And so I think that's one of the major uh, topics is actually to ask well, what is the potential source of funds? And from that, uh, then we can direct them directly to coastal management. Well, I've got lots Julie. of ideas. <laughs> yeah, I bet you do, Pete. I wanna go back to Juliet though briefly mm. because it, it, it's quite relevant when considering the current situation at, at Wire River and, and again, just a disclaimer that I've been quite involved in those negotiations. But, you know, one of the stumbling blocks is that um, no one quite knows who's supposed to pay. Even the departments don't really know who's supposed to pay. And when you look at an organisation like Good Kappa that's been set up to manage the, the coast and the Great Ocean Road, they don't actually have budget to pay for the mitigation. So Juliet, can you just speak to that in regard to how that then becomes a roadblock for the community in terms of even interacting with those organisations and trying to help solve problems? Yeah, it makes very little sense to me. And we spend hundreds of millions of dollars on the road itself, as Pete said, shoring it up, protecting it from landslides, protecting it from falling into the sea. But we don't spend comparable amounts on the actual coastal management itself. So it does nothing to mitigate the threats. It just, just props up the road. So, I mean, it's just quite ridiculous. And Gorkapa has been set up, as you said, without a source of funding. It has to generate its own funds, which, you know, people, 
people like the the campers on our foreshore they're the ones who are uh, providing the money for Gore Kappa not the busloads of tourists who come down the road as, as Jeff suggests I mean the whole idea about you know giving them a dedicated source of funding so they could do their job properly then they would be able to have the sandbags in stock you know they would be able to take action much more quickly when a hot spot blows up like it did at Y. You know, I mean, you know, you can you can argue until you're blue in the face about what they should or shouldn't have done. But if they had the resources available, they would be able to respond much more quickly when something like that happens. When it becomes, it gets to that point where if you don't do something, you're causing thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage. So mm -hmm. it, it's just it's completely out of whack as to where the money actually goes. Pete, I wanted to talk to you about the community sentiment in Apollo Bay. You know, it's it's plain that you have very strong views about this. I'm curious uh, just how fragmented the views are within the community, because one thing that even became apparent at Y River when there was started to be a community co conversation about what's causing the problem, what should fix the problem. You know, the, these views are, are far and, and wide and that can sort of become a, a problem in terms of progressing things as well. Do you think that there's community unity in Apollo Bay on sort of what the issues are and how to actually address them? Yeah, I think there is. We've had, like I said, lots of public meetings, information days. The Otway Forum has published a lot of the reports. You can access them online. Um, the information's there if you want to get it. They're all public documents. And, um, yeah, sure, we had a public meeting <laughs> uh, a couple of years ago and uh, we had Sarah Henderson and Richard Reardon and um, Joe McCracken from Colac Otway Shire and I put it on them. Do you believe in climate change? And Richard and Sarah just wouldn't answer the question. Joe... Um, said, yeah, I, I believe in it, but I, you know, well, what are you going to do about it, you know? Um, but what about members of the Apollo Bay community? You know, if, you, if you're sort of in the milk bar or down at the beach and you, you run into someone and you're sort of speaking to, oh, look at what's going on there with the dunes, you know, is there a sort of consolidated view about what's I, causing it? I think there is, but, hmm. you yeah, know, people are pretty apathetic. That's in another football score or the cricket score, you know? Um, but the information's there. There's no excuse, and there's no excuse for the politicians not to know what's going on. I can access these reports. I can read them. I can understand them. It's not that hard. They've been around for 30 years, and all the options have been looked at. Some of them have been tried, and these groins are probably only a 30, 40-year solution. Um, if we just keep burning fossil fuels, that's the issue. That's, and um, you want to get some money to pay for it, take away the diesel fuel tax, um, fuel, whatever it is, incentive for the mining industry. You know, the mining industry is getting more and more mechanised all the time. Trains, um, vehicles up in the mines, they'll all be elect electric, operated from Perth in the future. And, um, you know, Twiggy Forest, Gina Reinhardt, all of them, they're making billions. You know, some of that money... And you know, they're getting tax billions as well. And that's what that's the cause of it, coal mining, etc. Just well, Twingy, get, tw let, Twingy Forest is is suddenly um, quite on the front foot on this issue of climate. I, I want to come back to you, Jeff. There, there's a few questions that kind of fold into the big question of retreat. Um, mm. and you know, with something like the Wire River Surf Lifesaving Club, I think that we've suddenly had to be confronted by something that we thought was way down the track when literally in a period of roughly four months between March and July, as Juliet's presentation showed, we lost 10 metres of, of June and it was literally sort of sucking out a metre a day at one point, threatening the actual clubhouse. Um, Amanda asks, well, does the panel not remember that over the last 50 years, Anglesey Surf Life Saving Club buildings were lost in the sand dunes uh, way back in the 50s that two very larger dunes have disappeared from the surf, surf beach over that time. If you look at photos from the 40s, how was it ever considered to build huge concrete clubhouses on sand dunes? Um, Fairhaven, for example, and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. It's Well, Every one of those has been controversial, that's for sure. And uh, there is a, a principle in coastal management called coastal dependency that um, people oper 
often operate on. That is, you don't put something on a foreshore or very close to the coast that isn't, that can occur anywhere else. So surf lifesaving clubs, of course, become uh, a very difficult issue uh, because they do need to be relatively close. But whether or not you need, uh, and there was a push for this uh, probably a decade or more ago, the extent and size of some of those clubs. Now, yes, retreat is not going to help in most of these cases. You might um, be able to relocate some of your facilities away from the coast, but you're still going to have to have direct access and a view of the coast. Um, so I think that's a tricky problem. I'd also come back to your questions to Peter about um, overall sort of support. And it does re remind me of the Marine and Coastal Community Network that operated for almost 20 years. And it operated nationally and then with state coordinators and the principle it operated on was that everybody involved in it was concerned with the marine and coastal environment. They didn't necessarily agree on anything else. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it had fish, commercial fishing groups and marine protected area people and the rest, but they agreed to disagree on specific issues, but they were uniform on attempting to focus politicians on the marine and coastal environment where you know, over 80% of people live in the capital cities and the coastal areas. It's, um, it is a constant source of uh, wonder that given that um, politicians can still walk away from talking about coastal, coastal management. Well, it, it, it's funny you should say that because it actually brings me to the, the next question that I'm looking at on the screen from Anthony, who says, sometimes it feels like we're asking our current elected decision makers to make decisions today that are super hard and might cost them short term electorally, um, that's from me, not him, um, <laughs> for doing things that will result in benefits to future elected decision makers. So does the panel have views on how we enable our current decision makers to have courage for decisions that will be beneficial once they've likely retired? How do you encourage bravery in decision making that might end up getting you voted mm. out? For example, yep. a Great Ocean Road levy, which might actually save the coastline for future generations. What a, what a wonderful question. Um, people often talk of uh, NIMBY, not in my backyard, but um, politicians operate on NIMTU, not in my term of office. And so, if, and that's the real problem for, uh, for climate change in general. And it really spreads into such a wicked problem as coastal management that um, kicking the can down the road is, is the best outcome from a politician's term. If it's outside their term of office, then it's not seriously their problem. So in some ways you've got to therefore work on independent agencies that outlast the legislation and the agency outlasts the political term of whoever's in office at the time. Um, we've, we've seemed to have done that in two examples, regional examples in Victoria, where the Gorkap is the latest one and it's only early days for it. So it's going to be really challenging. Um, I'm on the Phillip Island Nature Park Sport, which is a fascinating model where the Penguin Parade raises all the money, but the Phillip Island Nature Parks now runs all the foreshore reserves and the entire coast of Phillip Island and a massive cross subsidization from a, uh, a you know, cash cow is spent on the rest of the coast. Mm -hmm. And those are the sorts of models I think we can seriously look at um, uh, in, in a wider sphere across the Victorian coast. Pete, could I come back to you? One of the uh, mooted ideas for why river obviously was various forms of groins. And as Juliet uh, detailed in the end, after unsuccessful sand scraping, they ended up putting three sandbag groins in which have successfully pushed the river over. But th there was a lot of discussion about rock walls and a sort of harder, a more permanent effort, which we may well yet see because, as was mentioned, there's still a, a report and long-term strategy. But going back to the Apollo Bay situation, are there any lessons learned about things that have been put in and then worsened the problem? Because, you know, it's kind of like you do one thing and, and it has a consequence. Yeah, that's right. Um, Sandbanks, just by their nature, they're not long-term, you know. They'll get moved around, they'll get shoved around, they'll get vandalised. 
Um, groins, I'm suggesting we won't know if these groins are going to work probably till about another four or five years down the track. And if they are working, we expect to have a beach 10 foot higher and 20 foot wider at high tide. If we haven't got that, they're not working. And you may extend them another 50, 100 metres and they may work better, but it's a race. It's a race between, you know, the sea level rise and the storm surges and all the rest of it, you know, and we have to vote for politicians that take that seriously. It's, it's not that hard. I'm not university trained, but I fully understand it and I've understood it since 1990, you know. 1960, when I was born, there was about 1 billion people on the planet. There's now 8 billion, heading towards 10 billion. You know, the carbon footprint of a person in 1950 was one ton a year. It's now 10 tons a year for every person on the, in the world. It's not that hard. It's accelerating. It's happening. We have to take it seriously. And if certain politicians don't want to take it seriously, don't vote for them. Can I ask you, Pete, uh, and this is a question um, from the room as well about moving some sec sections of the road. This is something that you, you mentioned and certainly it's something that's been posed. Do you think there's an appetite uh, or an acceptance by anyone who lives along the Great Ocean Road of moving sections of the road? Yeah, we're not talking long sections and we're not talking about moving it too far, but um, it's either that or there won't be a road or it'll be like Holland. Oh, Holland is a classic example. It's dikes all around. And, 20 years ago, they decided to raise them another five metres. You know, they're taking it seriously, but we don't want dikes. We don't want walls everywhere. We want some beaches. And if you go up in a helicopter and go along the Great Ocean Road, you'll, you'll already see that two thirds of the coast is just rock. The beach, the beach actual sandy beaches are very precious and we don't, we don't want to lose them. Hmm. Um, I, I wanted to come back to you on that, Jeff. Um, just because of this sort of perspective that comes up now and again where people say, oh, that, that, that's always happened. That's a cyclical thing. Um, you know, we've, we've seen that happen over time. And, you know, I could say, well, when we first bought our house at Separation Creek 10, 12 years ago, the beach was mostly rocks. Then over that time, it's been almost entirely sand and there's been almost no rock pools on the main part of the beach at all. Now we're seeing this change with very high tides and such. You know, how do you rebut that, that argument from those who say, oh, it's just part, all part of the cycle? Well, I suppose Peter's pointed out that the, the data shows that the sea level is rising and it is, it is a combination of those factors when they, uh, they're synergistic. And I think that's what you uh, that we need to emphasise to people who say they've said it all before, you know, that the tide just comes in, that that beach is eroded and it's come back. Uh, that, that may be true, but the difference now is that the level at which the waves are breaking in the extreme tide in a matter, in a storm surge is higher than it was before and moving be increasingly higher. And so... Uh, sure, there are cyclic changes and um, beaches have come and gone in the past, uh, but we are adding an extra layer of, of stress to the system. Um, and some of those cycles may continue, but you get a breakthrough on a major dune like the one running um, along the Point Road night shoreline there, uh, you're not going to be able to do anything ab about that but you'll certainly get a lot of pressure very quickly. Um, so it's, it's, there are cyclic events that are occurring, but it's when you combine them together with something such as uh, sea level rise uh, that you're going to see the major impacts. Yeah. I, I would say it's the speed of the change which is so frightening. I mean, mm. yes, beach erosion is not a new thing. It always happens. Beaches change over time. Of course they do. But all of a sudden, when you see your dunes, which you know have been there for 50, 60 years, as you've been looking at them for all that time, suddenly disappearing, it's a it's a whole new ball game. I mean, it's just not, not part of the normal cycle. It's just an exaggeration of the normal cycle. And who knows where it's going to end up? Mm, I think it's a great point. I mean, as someone who's covered cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons, bushfires and floods across four continents, 
it's in my mind it's the severity of the events and the fact that the time between them is narrowing so we're seeing them much more commonly um one last question we've got four minutes alistair makes the point and i think it's it's a reasonable question are they not too many organizations and authorities and governments responsible for so much of the future of this heritage listed road and local communities um, when you consider how many organisations have skin in this game, and I think this is something we've experienced at Y River when you try to get something quite mm -hmm. simple done, how many stakeholders actually have to tick off on action? I'll pose that one to you, Jeff. Is that something to consider actually consolidating? Uh, consolidation, um, uh, I mean, what we've done in Victoria over the last 20, 30 years and, and elsewhere is try to coordinate the existing groups and it, you you sit down and do something like a thesis and you add up 48 local government areas at the time 120 committees of management you know it, it, it's a great sound you say well let's just simplify it all the the issue is that most of those groups will still be in existence most of those agencies will still be in existence uh, local councils aren't going anywhere um, Surf life saving clubs aren't going anywhere. The state government's not going anywhere. Um, so although it sounds like, why don't we just all fold them in together into one big, big body, most of the agencies will still exist. So uh, your coordination is more the, um, the major point and, and long-term planning is, is, is a way around that. Um, you'd love to have less because obviously the more you have to deal with, the harder it gets. Uh, but uh, you, they don't go away by, if you re, just replace them with one body because they've got other, they have other roles, local councils, mm. a lot of other roles other than coastal management. Pete, I'll come back to you uh, and Juliet, you'll get the last word. Pete, did you have a, a final comment to make before we close? Um, well, just on that last subject, you know, we've got this new authority that, you know, they, it's been legislated, they, it's not even fully staffed yet, and you know, let alone budgets. What sort of budgets they're going to get? So the jury's out on that one. I mean, the concept's good, but um, and you do need those separate departments because they've all got expertise in certain areas. And we're lucky down this end of the coast, you know, because of that harbour, which is multi-million-dollar fishing industry works in and out of there. We have they have taken it seriously, and you know, for a lot of lobbying. And as you get, you're probably aware, as you get further down into the Otways, you, you know, the people that live here love the environment and they're not afraid to speak up for it, you know, and, um, and there's very intelligent people that have retired down here that, yeah, and the politicians are a little bit scared of us. <laughs> Juliet, last word to you. Yes, well, I think what's happened at Y has certainly galvanised the community. You know, everybody now knows you know, the, that we've got a we, that we've got a we've only got down to walk down to the beach to see that something's happened. So, mm. I mean, we had the bushfires a few years ago, but we didn't really grapple with the issue of climate change in connection with that. Whereas now it's slap bang in our faces, and we have to get you know get 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 active. We have to get coordinated we have to work together to work out what we do want for our community what is our longer term plan you know what are we going to do about our foreshore campground which you know we know is next 10 or 20 years is going to be underwater you know so how do we move forward in all these ways and you know and you have to work together as a community to come up with some solutions mm. It's been great to talk to the three of you thank you very much for such an interesting and informative panel on this really current issue. Jeff Westcott, Juliet Lefevre and Peter Fillmore have been our panellists today. Thank you everyone for being here this afternoon. The second webinar in this series, this is one of four, will be tomorrow at the same time, so starting at three o'clock, and it will cover the science of climate change and its coastal impacts. And your moderator for that event will be the legendary ABC science broadcaster, Robin Williams. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.